I've already given this job at least three coats of a wattle product uh, called Ready Seal and it's uh, just a sanding sealer and I'm about to put on the top coat so I'm using this one called Stylewood. It's a 50% gloss and it's a pre-catalyzed nitrocellulose lacquer. The thing I like about it is it's quick drying, it's relatively non-toxic and it's, uh, it gives a beautiful uniform finish with a, a lovely feel. And unlike um, some polyurethane finishes, it doesn't dry with that sticky sort of coating on the outside. So this needs to be sanded back. I've already done this piece here and I'm just using a bit of worn out 240 grit paper and double it over and just give that a light rub until you get a uniform finish on it. And for complicated areas like these edges, you can use steel wool. And in fact, steel wool, if you do that over the entire surface, you get this beautiful sheen to it. And then when your top coat goes on, it's, it gives you a much more uniform luster. So I don't know if you can see that bit of a shine that's coming up on that. But it just, it feels beautiful and your top coat just goes on lovely. So I'm about to do this and we're just going to give that a, a light sand. I don't think that it's worth trying to completely fill the grain on this. In fact, I sort of like the idea that you can see the texture in the grain. It just <laughs> lets you know that you're looking at a, a real piece of wood and not some fake piece of uh, plastic. Because uh, let's face it, we've got enough fake news in the world, we don't want fake wood as well. So as much as possible you try and sand with the grain and you've got to be careful to get right out to the, the very edges so let me just get on and do this it's a bit boring to watch but we'll catch up when we're ready for the top coat Well that's all the wood and the finish done so I can start assembly but I do need to address this ventilation grill. Some people have been concerned that this is going to form a sort of a portal for all sorts of bugs and insects to get inside the clock and live there and yes that will happen but don't worry I have a cunning plan. Okay, this is just ordinary stainless steel or fly screen mesh and I can't cut this with a laser and I can't mark out directly on it, but it can mark out on ordinary painter's tape. And I want to be able to cut this precisely to fit inside this frame. the thing I like about having a, a laser cutter engraver in the shop 
it just makes accurate setting out and marking out really simple. If you've got CAD drawings and you've done your DXF files, then you've got the ability to be able to make accurate geometry on your parts and just cut to the line. So I'll go ahead now and cut out that screen and we should be able to fit that exactly into the frame that we've made. And one of these days we're all going to have fiber laser machines in our shops. I'll be able to cut metal <laughs> and wood and anything you like and we'll all be happy. Okay, so this is the way this works. We are going to fabricate our screen. So we're going to have the two parts of our frame. We're going to put our mesh inside that and get all that bonded together. And that will go on the back of the clock. Job done. This material is some cheap Chinese laser engraving plastic that I bought. Uh, it's okay. But it's great for fabricating stuff like this. So it has a clear protective film on it. I'm just going to take that off. And we're going to bond this stuff together with uh, CA glue. It seems to work pretty well. I have no idea what the exact formulation of this plastic would be. So I don't know what sort of solvent glue you would use. So we'll just get the CA glue to wick in between the two halves of that frame there. And we'll bond that uh, fabricated frame together, and we're nearly done. This is my <laughs> friendly shed gecko again. Uh, this is the way we're going to bond this together. So I've got the little spring clamps there, and we'll just run some CA glue into the, the joint. It'll just suck into that um, interface there and bond the long edges, and we'll do the short ones. I'm just going to put a couple of little drops of CA in the corners and let that bond. When this is attached to the inside of the back of the clock, it can't escape anywhere. So it's just a temporary measure. Got this double sided tape at Aldi of all places and it's surprisingly good. And I can't think of a way of doing this with glue without making a mess. That's the key to getting this stuff to work is to burnish it down quite hard with something like a edge of a knife or edge of a screwdriver or something like that. It seems to require a fair amount of pressure to make it bond properly. And of course the other thing with this is it's a bit sudden death. If you get it wrong, you can't sort of change your mind. 
and sort of reposition it. Which is why I've got my tape there to try and get this aligned first time. So there you go, anti-insect screen, absolutely perfect. You can see here I've mounted the microcontroller inside the carcass of the clock on an acrylic plate and it's uh, got metal thread screws through some aluminium standoffs and this is double side taped to the bottom of the carcass. This is just temporarily positioned at the moment, uh, I've got some really good double sided tape for mounting this on and it's really only going to withstand having a USB plug shoved into it so I think it'll be fine. So what I need to do now is get this uh, back cover screwed down and also work out where this plate goes. Uh, this is our laser cut and laser engraved uh, switch panel and I need to get the hole for the USB port accurately lined up with the microcontroller underneath. So once again this is going to be done with double sided tape once I get all of this sorted, I can go ahead and fit all of the switches and the 5 volt power supply socket. This uh, clock is only going to have three switches, although it will take a fourth one for daylight saving time, which we don't bother about here. So uh, let's go ahead and get all this screwed down. I think that's, I think that's where we're going. I just want to get a couple of screws in the back of this before I put the uh, switch plate on. And what I really like these little nickel plated round head screws, I've got stacks of them. A bit hard to get these days. But the only thing you got to watch is that you don't let the screwdriver slip out of the slot and damage the work around it. And there used to be a technique, <laughs> sort of nobody does it anymore because we're all using uh, Phillips head screws or something similar, but back in the olden days you used to align the screw slot with the grain of the wood. It's called heading the screws. Ah, doesn't make it hold any better, it just looks nice. And here I was before talking about fake wood grain but unfortunately this was all I had that was going to do the job for this back panel. I have got some cheaper laser engraving plastic but the lettering always comes out of the grey. This material here is much better, more expensive but gives you a really good crisp definition with the laser engraving. So, yeah, I know it looks a bit cheesy, but who's going to see? It's the back of the clock. You know what? I'm going to cut that a bit bigger than the window there. 
I mean, years ago I bought two two scalpels uh, and they were the best thing I ever bought for the shop. The blades, you can buy them like a pack of a hundred and you know they're always super sharp. I got my blades from a, an online company that does horse or veterinary supplies. Okay, once again, this is a bit of a one-shot deal. And what I really want to do here is get the USB port lined up. Everything else is sort of not so critical. Okay, so I can get all my switches and connectors all hooked up now. So we're getting close. Well, I'm happy to report that I've got all my connections made now to the microcontroller. All the switches are working. I've got my 5 volt power supply socket in and I've got access to the USB port on the microcontroller. This has uh, just been taken out of the clock and it's about to go back in permanently. But the last job I need to do is to fit this LDR sensor. This is the light sensor that turns the clock into night mode and it needs to be external to the clock so somehow or other I've got to drill a hole in the clock case somewhere and then have this so that it can see daylight. And I initially thought I was going to fit it through the front panel but I chickened out. <laughs> I, I do not want to drill any holes or try and do anything to that uh, in case I damage it because that's the, the most visible part of the clock. Now, I should also admit that uh, I was setting up these switches. Uh, they have various different functions. This one can change the clock to display seconds and minutes instead of hours and minutes, but it can also change the function of the colons. This one uh, is the color switch, so it'll cycle through a set menu of colors. This one changed from 12 to 24 hour mode. I got these two switches working fine. I was struggling with this one and just no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to work. And then, guess what? Dumbass forgot to check the time. <laughs> We're still AM. So it didn't matter how many times I was pressing that button, it was never gonna make any difference. Ah, oh, you idiot, Mark. Anyway, it's going now and I can fit the LDR. So let's do that. Well, I can't leave a good reason why, but I've decided to put it down the left hand end of the clock carcass but right in the center of the frame. I didn't really want to put it right on the joint line of the veneer up here so this will do. It's fairly unobtrusive but uh, like I say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna drill holes in this front panel here. <laughs> no way. So I'm gonna drill undersized. It's four and a half millimeters and I've checked we got clearance inside. And I'll just enlarge that now to five millimeters. Let's just hope we haven't damaged our veneer. raise a little bit of a burr there. I think you can see that burr uh, and I don't want to use a countersink or anything like that. I'm just going to put my tailstock center, dead center, into that. Just try and push those burrs inwards. Okay, that's not too bad. What I'm planning to do later on is to push that under the surface by a millimeter and then just put some of that UV curing resin over the top to make like a little rounded lens and set the resin. And that'll sort of hold it in place but also make it look a bit neater. Okay, let's get the clock together. 
Well, we're about to fit this permanently now. I've cleaned everything with some alcohol. I've got a mark in the bottom of the carcass here, so I know how to line everything up. Get some pressure on that acrylic, push it down hard. Okay, I think we can put all this together now. Just want to be sure I don't trap any wires anywhere. It all feels good. All right, let's see it from the front. Well, there it is, nearly finished. And I say nearly because I want to put a little logo down this bottom left-hand corner here. But I'm going to run that as a separate video uh, because it's got some interesting techniques and I thought it was worth showing you uh, just as a standalone video. But I will give you a little preview. So, uh, Am I happy with the way the clock's turned out? Yes, I love the clean look at the front of the clock and just the simple lines. It's got that sort of 1930s style aesthetic. And having said that, if you wanted to design this clock differently, there's lots and lots of scope for improvement, or at least a different style. Um, this front panel could be made from rice paper, translucent acrylic, you could use different types of cloth, or even uh, like etched glass if you wanted to anything that's going to allow the light to transmit through there. The case itself, I think that's a good candidate for doing as a, like a mid-century modern style of clock or even the atomic age uh, style. <laughs> Google that, uh, it's got some impressive stuff. Uh, or you could go full on Victorian. In fact, I'm doing another clock for a, uh, my mentor that's been working on the code for this and it's got a, some Victorian elements in it. So that's coming up soon. But let me run you through some of the functions. The first one is the night mode. So if we cover up the LDR, it goes to that uh, dark magenta color. But uh, you can set that color in the code itself. Uh, the button on the back, which cycles through the colors, takes us through a whole range. I think it's about 10. Some of these are quite dark. And these are the ones you would use for the, the night mode. Let's get back to something a bit brighter. Okay, the next button along on the back there changes from 12 hour to 24 hour mode, which now is going to work for us <laughs> because we're in the afternoon, uh, back to 12 hour mode. And the last button changes from hours and minutes to minutes and seconds. So there we are in minutes and seconds. And the same button, if you do a long press, will change the colon mode. So at the moment we're just on the blink mode and that one is what we call a breathing mode so it dims and brightens and another press another long press takes it to the the columns being on permanently so that's the function of the clock and yeah it's working well so i'm going to finish up here now by showing you some evocative images of the clock in its natural environment and i invite you to join me on the next video which is going to be making the, the little logo as I said and then the follow-up one where we're going to do Mitch's clock for him. So for now thanks for watching and uh, I'll catch up with you next time. Please leave a comment if you like the video and I don't normally say this but do all that normal stuff of you know sharing and liking if you really want to. So it's uh, Prezzo signing out for now and I'll check you on the next video. Thanks for watching.